Welcome to Mostly Minutia. I'm Colleen Lindell. This is episode 31. My guest today is Pamela Atherton, and Pamela happens to be one of my personal heroes. When this podcast had been a mere glimmer in my eye, and I have been oscillating back and forth about whether I should do this show, because honestly, for years I had had an insatiable desire to interview people and help them share their stories, but I wondered if I was going to fail and how I was going to pull it off, given that I didn't understand the technology behind podcasting, and I had never interviewed anybody professionally. Pam was someone who encouraged me right from the beginning to really go for it and follow my curiosity. Pamela and I were introduced by a mutual friend, Grace Ann Carter, and Grace is a script supervisor on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is a TV show I worked on for a while. Grace happens to be a nurturing, rooted force on set, and she has encouraged and believed in me from the moment I began pondering the idea of this podcast. In fact, she said, you know who you have to meet. You have to meet my friend Pam. It's amazing what happens when you just start speaking your dreams out loud, you know, and to the right people. So I was introduced to Pam and instantly found a home in her natural curiosity. It felt like, ah, finally, I'm talking with someone who gets my brain. Pam is an A-plus, top-notch, knock-your-socks-off interviewer and host. And if you were lucky enough to be in her presence, she'll make you feel like a million bucks with her positivity. Pam has worked in radio for years. She has a show called A Closer Look, and her tagline is, we go where our curiosity takes us. And this explains Pam to a T. She has interviewed all sorts of people from life coaches and financial experts to Olympians, celebrities, and authors. Some of her guests have been Cher, Willie Nelson, Buzz Aldrin, Carl Reiner, Kenny Loggins, and Madeline Albright, just to name a few. And Pam is truly amazing. She gets an A for hospitality. Her bedside manner is on fleek. She's able to make her guests feel so comfortable and welcome and showers them with compliments and thanks them for their time. She also reads their books, which I found out during this interview is a practice that sometimes other interviewers do not partake in. A quick note to the listener, at the beginning of this interview, Pam is actually teaching me how to use my microphone, believe it or not. Right before I hit record, I've been sharing with her that one of my mics wasn't picking up sound like I thought it should. She picks up the mic, turns it to the side and says, this is how you use it. It's called side address. And that is where we begin episode 31 with Pam Atherton. Interestingly, put on your headphones and see if you can hear a difference in the sound of the voice of doing the side address. Is there any kind of, do you notice any kind of a difference? Um, Yeah, I do. You do? Actually, yeah, you're more poignant. It should be a warmer sound. It is, and it's it's actually picking up your voice better. Yeah, it's because that's it's, that's where it's, it's designed to be. for it. And yeah. I never knew that. I <laughs> I've been wondering actually. Um, I got that mic because that's the mic that. Um, oh my gosh, the host of This American Life. Oh sure, Ira Glass. Ira Glass. That's the mic he uses, and yeah. he, he did this um, like a tutorial online about the equipment he uses and like the approach he takes to interviewing and things like that. And I'm like, well, I'll just get the same equipment that he gets. Right. Then I was like, why does this mic not pick up voices? The way his does. Yeah. Right. I was like, gosh, I feel like I have to like really pump up the gain afterwards. Right. Well, you talk softly anyway. So yours, you would have to. Yeah. On mine, I have a lot of depth to it. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, it's because it's a side address. I've learned about myself that I... I mean, I can be at a party using my diaphragm as much as possible, and Pam, I cannot project. It won't come out of me, or or maybe I just You're just not to... ready to let it come out. I mean, when the time comes, I think maybe the reason I can is because I was a camp counselor, right? And you have to be able to say, hey, pull it all out of you, you know, and be able to go, hey, you know. You were a camp counselor? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was also a, an assistant wrangler. I was a woodcraft ranger. When I was a kid, I was a woodcraft ranger. And it was started by Ernest Thompson Seton, who is a naturalist. And he wanted something kind of like the boy guides and the girl guides. But it was based on Indian lore. Hmm. So everything we learned was about Indian, you Mm -hmm. know. So I could track and trail. I could um, shoot a bow and arrow, you know, all of those things. And you won 
coups. So instead of badges like the Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts, you've got coups. Mm -hmm. And then those coups would go in your honor band. Well, there was a summer camp that they did up in Castaic and Newhall area. Mm -hmm. It's called Stanley Ranch. And they got a lot of sponsorships, if you will, for inner city kids. Hmm. So there were a lot of inner city kids. And I had gone when I was a kid. So when I graduated high school at 17, I applied to work out there as a junior counselor. Mm -hmm. And so they hired me as a junior counselor and immediately put me as the assistant wrangler. Hmm. So I would get up at five or so in the morning, I would hay the horses in my nightgown, and then I would go and have breakfast, and then right after breakfast, I would go down and I would saddle and bridle 12 horses, and then we would ride, and then at lunch, I would loosen the girths and unbridle them and water them, and then came time, lunch and siesta was over because it's hot up in in Castaic, as you know. I would go and tighten the girths, rebridle everybody, we'd go out for rides, we'd come home, I'd unsaddle the horses, unbridle the horses, feed the horses and I lost 30 pounds that summer. <laughs> <laughs> Had you grown up with horses? No, not at all. And we, you would get a day and a half off a week. That's what mm-hmm. you would get. And unless I went into town with somebody, I stayed up at the camp the whole time. So I even rode on my days off. Okay. And I loved to ride. So I would ride bareback, you know, if I, you know, on the on my days off for fun. I would Take, we, there was like a two mile stretch down to get the mail and I would you know run my horse down there and get the mail and then walk back you know with the, it was I just loved it it was great do you do you naturally understand horses I don't know if I understand them but I definitely uh, have great respect for them I don't mm. know I mean back then you learned you walk you put your hand on their butt and you walked around them and you didn't have a problem um, I don't know if I would be that confident today mm-hmm. you know because it's been so long since I've ridden hmm. um, but you know I always felt like you should be talking to him. So I would talk to him all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, what are you going to do? You're out there at five in the morning and give, throwing hay at him. Hey, you know. Yeah. Do they respond to you like when you're talking with them like that? I think they... so. Uh, and some do more than others. I mean, they're definitely, they have personalities. Yeah. I always end up making friends with people who have had very interesting experiences with horses. Yeah. This is something that I've been noticing is a pattern in my life. Like I'll be really good friends with someone and all of a sudden realize, oh, they trained horses their whole life. Or even the neighborhood that I live in right now is the horse neighborhood of L.A. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah. It's all the stables are there. Um, People will walk their horse down the street right in front of my house. And somebody in my neighborhood owns a mini horse and walks it around. So one of the things that I learned that I that I've carried with me for my life and use in workshops all the time is stuff that I learned riding horses. And one of those was I used to be the person in the back. I was the roundup person. Mm -hmm. And so you'd have these kids get on the horses screaming Hmm. and then their horse would take off. And so you would have to calm the horse and calm the kid at the same time. And one of the things that I learned was this thing where you start not quite at their level, but you are lower than that, and then you bring them down with the, the speed of your voice and the volume of your voice, and you're very monotone as you talk, and that calms the animal and it calms the kid. Wow. So while he's, you know, while he's doing, you're saying, you're going to be fine, Colleen. That's fine, Colleen. Everything is fine. Mm-hmm. So just calm down, and then you see I'm slowing down as I talk. Hmm. And then what happens is the other person starts to slow down at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so that I use now if I'm in an unruly group of people, Mm -hmm. you know, um, that's one of the ways that you can help to bring that that situation down. So Mm -hmm. I use that when I teach workshops. Have you ever studied mediating or anything like that? Or like... You no, know, negotiation I did. Okay. Yeah, because I had an interview with a wonderful guy. He wrote a book called Fearless Negotiation. And mm. so here's the tip. I'm going to tell you it's so easy. It's called Wish, Want, Walk Away. And what he says basically in the book, and it's a great book, go get it. Um, I can't think of his last name. It's Michael's his first name in the book, Fearless Negotiation. He says when you start a negotiation, you start off with what you wish for. That's everything you could possibly get. Hmm. Then you write a list of what you want, which is probably what's most likely will happen in the job or in the negotiation. And then there's the walk away. At what point, will what do they say that you say, that's it, I'm walking away? And once you have that set and then you go into the negotiation, you're in a power position because you don't have to stop and think about what they say to you because thinking is where they get you. Mm -hmm. So if somebody says to you, um, well, uh, you're going to have to bring your own car. 
and that's a walk away point for you, you know that and you mm-hmm. say, I'm sorry, then this isn't going to work. Mm. And then they either try to come back from it or what. So the walk away is really important. The wish is what you start with because you can always negotiate down, but you can't negotiate up. Mm-hmm. So if you, there's a, a job and you say, well, listen, I need to see my, I have to watch my kids play sports every week. So I need Monday, Wednesday, Friday um, to be able to leave at four. What may happen is they're like, okay. And you get it. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you had said before, you know, okay, I work nine to five. Is there any possible way for three days a week I could get up? They're like, no, I'm sorry. We don't do that. And that's in any situation that you do. You can use that. Uh, personal relationships. Mm-hmm. Where's the point when you say, I, I'm, I no longer will tolerate this. Mm-hmm. That's my walk away. Uh, that's good. Yeah, that's it's good. great. Um, well, Pam, I wanted to thank you, first of all, for giving me some of your time today. Oh, I know thrilled. You were And have been so encouraging to me as far as, because a few years ago, I was introduced to you via Grace Carter. Right. And um, at that time, I think that having a podcast was like just a glimmer in my mind and more like interviewing people was what I was very interested in. And you were the first person that I spoke with who was very very encouraging, but extremely positive, optimistic, excited about curiosity. And um, that was like something that was piquing my interest as far as really wanting to interview you this year. Because I, I wrote up a list of my dream interviews for 2017, and you were on my list. Oh, thank you. And uh, That means a lot. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, a lot of the people that were on my list are who I consider to be door openers for others. They're like people who allow others to shine before they're like, I have to shine, you know, or let let someone else walk through the door first and then they'll walk through the door. And I I do think that you do that for other people consistently. You know, there's an old saying that the Buddha, and I I can't, I'm going to paraphrase it because I can't remember, but it's basically that lighting your candle doesn't make mine go out. It just Mm. creates more light in the world. So why not? Why not share what you have? It doesn't take away from what I have. It just enhances what you have. Hmm. Yeah, you you seem like totally fearless to me in in terms of who you pursue to interview, um, the questions that you ask people, I feel like are so playful and showing like the utmost respect to the people that you interview as well. And I'm just wondering, and oh, even the tagline for your show, I wrote down, <laughs> I was like, this is the best tagline. We go where curiosity takes us. Yes. Yeah. And the reason is that for that is that I don't have... Um, a set thing. It's not like business or marketing or whatever, but it's wherever curiosity takes us. And, and you know, if there's, if I see something that's interesting, I'll say to somebody, I, I want to interview you about that, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's like, I couldn't quite contain what it was. There was no real name for it. There, you know, what is it? Well, I just go wherever, Yeah. You know, whatever sounds interesting. Did you make up that line? Yeah. When when did you discover that you were a curious person and Oh always. I, yeah. Always. And and so I'll I'll tell you a little bit of a backstory and how I even got into interviewing at all. Because when I was growing up I was gonna be an actress. That's always what I wanted to do. And then I went to college and um pardon me if any of your listening audience is college students, but um you're just an ass when you're in college and you're in the drama department. You just are. <laughs> it's all ego, it's all about you, it's all dramatic, it's all uh, and I just couldn't. Hmm. So I switched to uh, journalism, which at my uni- my college was um, radio, television, newspaper. Mm-hmm. And this was in the 70s. And so I loved newspaper. I was, the, I was scheduled to be the um, editor of the college newspaper, but I had to take radio and television. It was, I had no choice. And there were only two of us females in the class because in the 70s, in the mid-70s, women really were not, you, there were no women on AM radio. There were some on FM at late at night in New York named Turquoise that would talk about coming up next, it's the Moody Blues. Yeah, I'm telling you, it's really heavy. That's coming up, so... Stay with us. Okay, that was, you know, that was the yeah. kind of stuff that was going on. <laughs> and and I really didn't want to take the classes, but I had no choice. So that's where I got my start learning television. And then in radio, of course, back then it was the fast moving, the real Don Steele, you know, that kind of a, a talk, you know, a humble harv, and you would talk over the vocals, and you would be bah, bah, boo, boom, you know. And you had to get your radio license, which at that time was a third class license with a nine, um Element 9 endorsement, which meant you had to know some electronics. Mm -hmm. My dad had been an engineer 
uh, and had actually helped build radio stations in uh, Louisiana. So he worked with me and I passed all of my stuff and got my license. Then my teacher said to me one day, listen, the real Don Steele needs a secretary. And uh, they asked me if I had anybody and I thought of you. <laughs> and I would have had to quit being the editor of the college newspaper hmm. for a job that was four hours a day at three dollars an hour and of course I took the job <laughs> because it was the real Don Steele and I mean you're too young to know how famous he was but he was I mean he, Tina Delgado is alive alive is his famous line that he used to do he was a boss jock and hmm. he, this wasn't when he was at K, KHJ this is when he was at um, K100 and so I drove every single day out there and I worked from three until seven and and worked for him um and learned radio the right way okay mm -hmm. when he was fired uh, again who, who knows where the guts come from i didn't at the time know it was dumb i called up khj and asked to talk to this the uh, general manager who's like the, the program manager the head guy and i'm like <laughs> listen so he he must have been like shocked that somebody would have the audacity to do this <laughs> so i called him up and and i said listen they just fired the real don Steele, and i don't want to work for a radio station that's, that fires the real don Steele. so i'd like to go work for you I mean, he must have been like, who is this broad, right? <laughs> and he goes, okay, come on in for an interview. So I go in and I interview with him and he hires me on the spot. And, hmm. and I was a request girl. I mean, that's really the only place you could go then. Hmm. So my job was to answer the phones and write down all the requests, make coffee for the jocks, you know. And again, a little tidbit at the time, they generally hired females that were, how do I put this? A little more open morally than I was. Mm -hmm. And so I was known as the one girl who didn't sleep with the jocks. And I pushed more my uh, intelligence. That was more than what I wanted to do. So I became really good friends with the engineers, because back then you had to have engineers. There's a whole other story about that, about singing, but I won't get into that. But that's where I really, you know, got my understanding of how to do radio was from them. Hmm. Years later, uh, I decided to get into voiceover. Because I, now I, I can take my acting, my desire for acting, and my desire for voice, put them together, and nobody cares what I look like. Because hmm. that's, you know what it's like in town, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about how you look and all that stuff. Here, I don't have to worry if I have a bad hair day. So I studied under Gordon Jump, hmm. who was the Maytag man and was WKRP, and Susan Blue, and Andrea Romano. I mean, names that are now way big producers and stuff. Hmm. And I made a demo and started doing voiceover. Moved to Dallas, did a ton of voiceover in Dallas. In fact, um, there's a toy called the Peekaboo Zoo that um, was one of those where you would turn a dial and the hand would come up or you'd push a lever and the, for kids, kids. Texas Instruments put it together, the very first toy that had human voice on it. Prior to that, it was all mechanically done. And we all signed all the non-disclosures and we all came in and we had to in, do animals. And I use this story a lot in the workshops that I give as to making that risk because you're asked to stand there and make a noise like a monkey or make a noise like a parrot and they want you to act it out because Disney, if you do any voiceover for Disney, you actually have to work the motion. So if you're running in a Disney thing, you physically have to be running in the studio because they, they know that has a different sound in your voice. Right. So right. you get this, this person there who says, darling, uh, we like what you've been doing, but we'd like you to, uh, we'd like you to like up the energy, but slow it down a little. And you're just smiling the whole time because they can all see you. And it's the president of TI and the president of the advertising agency and all that. Like, so what we'd like you to do is, can you kind of, well, darling, can you make some of those monkey movements when you do that monkey voice? Could you do that? <laughs> and you're sitting there and you're like, I'm going to get paid $150 for this. Do I want to sit here and act like a monkey in front of all of these people? And you got that split second where you're thinking about that. Or are you just going just gonna to blow it off and go? And, you know, that's where I say you got to take the risk. And so that's where I moved back and I did this. And I was like, <laughs> and I got the job. <laughs> So it's one of those things where I, I tell you, you take the risk or you don't. So I'm on the toy. And then years later, I find out that I'm actually the, that's the sound effect. I'm the, I'm the monkey sound effect. But the one I got was the elephant um, who's, I'm Emily Elephant. See my big ears? And so I'm on this toy. So, uh, so anyway, that was the point of, uh, I forgot to get you where I got. So I was <laughs> doing the voiceover and then I moved to New Mexico mm -hmm. and I go to an agency and I say, I'm going to do voiceover. And they say, 
well, darling, we pay like ten dollars, and I'd already been taught you don't even walk in a studio for less than a hundred bucks. And I'm like, what? They go, we, the radio stations do it for us for free. So I send my demo to a radio station, and they hire me part time, you know, five dollars an hour, and uh, I'll be the head of creative services. And so I start doing um, commercials, but I mean. In the radio business, you're putting them out. I can remember at Christmas, we would easily do 15 a day at mm-hmm. Christmas. And that's really what got me good at doing voiceover, hmm. was having to do that many that often mm-hmm. and and sound a little bit different in them. And finally they said, look, we're going to flip this radio station from um, country to oldies. You want to do a shift on it. So I hadn't done radio since I was in college, went back to doing it. And how I got into interviewing was, because this was oldies, right? I was dating this guy. I'd been divorced, and I was dating this guy, and he was like kind of emotionally unavailable. And I thought, God, I just need to figure this out. And I'm flipping through one of those books of people who are available for interviews, and there's this guy who works on relationships. And I'm like, oh, I'll just do an interview with him. 10 minutes, because I'm on a music station, so really eight minutes is all I can really do for an interview. Mm -hmm. And I'll do an interview with him and see what I can glean about this relationship, but I won't let anyone know it's about me. You know, so I get the guy on. I'm like, so it's coming close to Valentine's Day and all this kind of stuff. Let's talk about this. Where, you know, some of the problems that are happening in relationships, like, I don't know, you, you hear the term emotionally unavailable. I mean, what, what, what do you do when you have someone like that, right? <laughs> so I do this. And so we finish the whole thing and I'm like, oh my God, this is great. Anything I want to know, I just interview somebody. Hmm. So I thought, but they're going to be on to me if I bring another relationship person in. So I better do something about sports. So I get some guy about sports and I do an eight minute interview with him. And then I get another one. I think I'll do health, you know, so I get a health one, do another eight minute interview with him. And then by then it's been long enough. I can bring a relationship person back in. Well, now (laughs) I'm having fun because this is like anything I want to know. The lieutenant governor of New Mexico had been from our town and he heard about that. He asked if he could be on my show every Tuesday. So while they were in session every Tuesday, so that was my start of learning how to talk to politicians, was that. Well, now I'm hooked because anything I want to know anything about, all I have to do is interview somebody. And they eventually gave me an hour show, and so, but it was on the weekend, and that's when I started learning to do the long form. Mm. Um, and then when I went to Washington, I had a one-hour show. And I could either do a one hour full or 320s, you know, mm-hmm. 320 minute interviews. So I did a complete morning show and then I did a one hour talk show hmm. and then commercials after that. So Wow. And, and how did you learn how to ask questions? Is it something that you've always done is, you know, just being able to because you ask questions in a very unique way. Sometimes I notice you'll like give and I don't think you're doing it like you know, thinking about the formula of how you're asking the question, but you'll like give a compliment to the, the guest and you'll follow up that compliment with a question almost around that compliment. It's kind of like a cool way of um, ushering your guest into talking about themselves and wanting to answer the questions. It's so gracious. It Pam. took a long time for me to get the hang of what I, how I wanted to do it because my fear was always, what do you do if you get a guest on and all they do is go, uh-huh, uh-huh, no. Yeah. What, or they're really bad. And I'll tell you a story behind that that I can't mention names. But um, a good, a very dear friend of mine who has been in radio for a long time, and he does interview stuff from time to time, and he had a very famous performer on who had been big in the 50s and 60s. And he was so excited to have this person on because they were so famous. And they came into the studio and they were drunk. Hmm. And they gave an awful interview. So he called up a friend of his from another radio station and said, oh, my God, Joe Blow was so horrible on the air. I couldn't believe it. I mean, that was such a, it was so awful. And his friend said to him, actually, it was you. And he said, what? And he said, you always have to remember that you're in charge of the audience, what the audience hears. And if you have a guest who is bad, then it's your responsibility to either make him better or get him off the air. Hmm. Because your responsibility isn't to the guest, it's to the audience. And once you realize that, that helps you with your timing, making sure things don't run too long, Mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And you think, well, how do I cut off, you know, Colleen Lindell? How do I cut her off? And it's like, you know what? It doesn't matter because it's the audience that matters. So Mm -hmm. you go, gosh, Colleen, I wish we could talk for a longer. I really do. But we've got to go. I've got something coming up. We'll keep in touch. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you usher her the heck out and you don't, you know, you never comes on again. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing that I learned. The second thing that I learned was that a lot of people who, especially authors, 
are very introverted and they're not comfortable speaking about themselves. So number one, I read every book that I do an interview on. Now, do I cheat? Yes, of course. So if it's like a nonfiction, I might not read the entire book, but I might go through it bit by bit, you know, so I get the voice of the person and the important parts. And for fiction, I always read the front, the end, and the middle. So I will know that kind of information. That right there speaks to the guest because I cannot tell you you can ask any publicist out there, but the number's close to 90% of the people don't read the books. Larry King was famous for saying he didn't read the books. Oh, and he would just interview people yeah. about their book? But yeah, he, he would say, I, I don't want it to be a surprise. I don't want to interview them. And, and to <laughs> me, I felt like it was almost disrespectful. Yeah. Because if you've taken the time to write a book and you're out there doing it, the least I can do is read it mm -hmm. and be able to talk about it. So that was number one. And that speaks volumes to the guests because they're not used to that. Mm -hmm. They're used to people saying, so, Colleen, you wrote this book about plants. Tell us about it. And then you're on a monologue. So that was the first thing. The second thing I learned was with them being so introverted, number one, I had to let the audience know why they needed to care about that guest, mm -hmm. number one. And number two, I had to make the guest feel good about how I felt about them. Hmm. So my intros were about 90 seconds long, somewhere in that, that range. And I've actually accidentally become famous because of them, mm -hmm. where people will say to me, oh, you'll hear them on the interviews where people will say, that's the best intro I've ever had, or you know, all of those things. And it's for two purposes. One, it's to make sure you, the listener, are gonna care about my guest. Mm -hmm. And then number two, my guest to feel comfortable because I've made them feel good, the fact that they've won all these awards and they're the expert to go to, and they're the one that knows. Once I've got that, then they're more comfortable being able to interview with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and for your guest, they understand that you know who they are. Yes, yes. And that I care about them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Your intros are so beautiful. Thank and it, they're so interesting because um, you don't realize that you're doing it live. Because so many people, I mean, I pre-record my intros. Right. And... Um, you know, not with the guest. And all of a sudden your guests will pop in and say, thank you, it's so great to be here with you. Wow, what an introduction, you know? And it's like, wow, she just did that all live with Well, them. and see, and that's the other point was that uh, sometimes you get a very short period of time with a guest. Sometimes you'll get four minutes or they'll give you 10 minutes. And mm. I'm wasting, I, I say hello in the beginning to talk to them a little bit before we tape just so that I can let them know that I've got the correct information. And then I do at least a 90 second intro. So I've already cut two minutes off of my, my interview time with them. Mm -hmm. And people have said, well, just do the interview, just do the intro after. I'm like, mm -mm, they need to hear it. Hmm. There's just something different when they hear it mm -hmm. that they respond better. Yeah, I actually, I feel challenged by that. I feel like I should try it. I feel like I should try it. Um, but see, I don't know. Well, one time I was in Vancouver and I, I was interviewing an author there, but I was interviewing her about Canadian health insurance because I went to school in Vancouver and right. a lot of people here had spoken about, oh, well, you know, if I was just living in Canada, then I'd have free health care. And right. I just thought, you know what, I'm going to go ask my Canadian friends right. about the health care. And so I had interviewed this author. And um, I felt like I needed to give her an intro, like right in front of her. So right. I wrote up an intro and I said, I, I want to interview you. And I said, but let me read this first. And I read it and I could tell it totally softened her. It's amazing how it works. Like I almost felt like she felt maybe a little sheepish that I was, you know, reading all these things about her. But I also felt like she was kind of grinning a little bit. So, <laughs> well, don't we all respond well to compliments? Yeah. And when you do an intro that says, you know, I've followed her for a long time and, you know, uh, she does great work. And by the way, you can read her stuff on, on uh, you know, uh, Huffington Post mm. and blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, oh, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. When they, I get introed, when I do these uh, moderations or when I do these in conversations with, mm. sometimes they'll use the intro that I provide them, but sometimes they won't and they'll, they'll dig around and I'll go, oh, I totally forgot I did that. <laughs> And then when you people know? do that for you, do you say, thank you for the intro? Yes. Do you, wow. Yeah, because, mm -hmm. I mean, even though you know the the reason that you do it, because it helps them, it, you still fall for it. Hmm. It's like I do media training. So I work a lot with um, celebrities and experts and authors on how to give good interviews. Hmm. And one of the things I tell them is that people love it when they say, you know what, Colleen, that is a great question. Mm. Or when they say, oh, Colleen, I am so glad you asked that question. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that. I teach it. 
And yet when somebody does it to me, I still fall for it. I still preen and go, oh, I asked a good question. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's such a good feeling. I, yeah. And then also, you know, I noticed that a lot of your interviews, they're all different time frames. Right. And that was a big question I had for you is, is, is it the amount of time that the guest has yeah because your long form interviews are so good Pam well when I was doing them live okay I had to fit an hour so the problem was a lot of your big names won't do an hour Mm -hmm. so you're stuck do I do three and then hope they all show up and then I got to do three different intros and read three different books and everything else Mm -hmm. or or what do we do so publicists kept saying to me look I I can't give you an hour I can give you 15 or 20 minutes that's it Mm -hmm. so I decided to stop going live when live allowed me to take phone calls um, but it's still, you know, you were it still felt like you were hawking for it. So give me a call. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Come on, call me now. Mm-hmm. So, um, so once I went into the pure podcast forum, which was right around 2008, mm-hmm. that opened the door for me to get Ted Kennedy, for me to get Cher, you know, some mm-hmm. of these bigger names, because they would say, look, we can give you, you know, 10 minutes and then always they lie to you, right? Mm-hmm. They'll go, oh yeah, so you're set for four minutes. And I'm like, what? You told me 10. No, nope. Senator Kennedy only has four. And so, you know, now you're scrambling thinking, which order am I going to ask my questions? Because I need to get all the right information out. Mm -hmm. When I do an hour, this was another trick that I learned. When I do an hour, and it's 20, 20, 20, it's basically how you break it up. The first 20 was spent making the guest feel fabulous. Hmm. So everything would be about, gosh, those awards you won. How did you feel when you won that award? Because I need them to soften up. Mm -hmm. Then that second... 20 was when you started to ask the questions, the, mm. the deeper questions. And there are ways to do it. Barbara um, Walters is famous for it, where she does not... Do you have the book? You yes, you do. Me, yeah, you had me read this. <laughs> uh, you did. So it's called How to Talk to Anybody About Anything. Isn't mm-hmm. How to Talk to Practically Anybody About Practically Anything. And I learned a ton from it. Hmm. You know, one of the most famous things I learned from that was where she says, she's talking to this guy who's, you know, the ambassador to Bushlerstan, and she sits next to him and she said, everybody's already asked him, you know, how do you like America? How do you like the pizzas? Whatever. She says, I turned to him and said, so tell me about your grandson. Hmm. And she said, you find this thing that you connect with them that has nothing to do with their job and you'll find a better way to connect. Mm -hmm. So that was really an interesting um, thing. So Barbara Walters is famous for never taking on the negative herself. Mm -hmm. She never says, well, I've heard you did this or whatever. She always says, some people say or it's been said that you're difficult to get along with. Or what do you say to those people who say you're difficult to get along with? She does that to extract herself from the situation. Mm-hmm. It's brilliant. And I sometimes remember it and sometimes I don't. But mm-hmm. So I'll get into the tougher questions in that second 20. That's when I, they already know I'm on their side. Mm-hmm. So they know I'm not asking to be you know, a problematic. And um, you'll also notice when I talk to doctors, I almost always exclusively call them doc. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's just a way to create some approachability. Mm-hmm. So I'll say something like, well, yeah, but Doc, what about all those people who died from that? Mm-hmm. I mean, what, what do you say about that? And by now, since I've been nice that first 20 minutes, now they're much more likely to realize I'm not there to, to ping them. I'm there to get a real answer. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'll do. It's harder to do that if you've only got four to five minutes or if you've got 10 minutes. But you, in your short time frames, you ask such good follow-up questions. I'm like, how does she choose, what, pick and choose, like your, the Willie Nelson interview? Yes. I'm like, how is she, he, you said he just called the station. He did. And you know the story behind that, right? Well, I just read about it on your page. Yeah. But would you tell Boy, us? that was, yeah, that, let me tell you, that was another lesson that you learn consistently through this. I'm one of the things, the other things that I, I'm, I'm consistent about, and you know this because when we talked about you starting one uh, a podcast, it was you must do your research. You absolutely must. You cannot be caught unawares and not know something about your guest because that's just rude. So Willie Nelson was coming out to the county fair and I wanted an interview with him. I had one with Weird Al already and Weird Al's wonderful. Hmm. He's a wonderful man. And so we kept calling the, his company and Willie Nelson's company, and they would say, well, we just never know, you know, uh, so I, don't, I wouldn't count on it. Well, I'd hired two interns, and so I'd set them on doing my research for me. I said, find out everything you can about Willie Nelson, write up some questions for me, because I was doing all these other things. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of blew it off. And um, then another project came up, and they couldn't finish the Willie Nelson. I wasn't worried. He's not going to call, mm-hmm. you know. So you were letting it go. You were. Like I let it go. I mean, there's nothing I can do. I mean, he's not going to call. We we kept calling, and they kept saying, "Well, if he calls, we'll let you know." But I don't think it's going to happen. Nobody called us. 
out of the blue, I'm in the back, it's like three in the afternoon, I'm about ready to go, and a phone calls, goes, yeah, there's some guy in the phone for you. I'm like, okay, fine, and I go pick it up, and I go, how's this, and he goes, hi, this is Willie Nelson. And you know what you're thinking at that point in time? Oh, dear God. (laughs) And a whole bunch of other words that I've learned not to say with a microphone in front of me, right? And I'm like, I I, I just have to, I have to uh, put you on hold uh, because I have to get, we were using reel-to-reels back in those days. I got got to get the reel-to-reel going. And I said, said, are you going to be okay? Oh, fine, fine, not a problem. So I put him on hold. I get the reel-to-reel set up and I'm like, I jot down with my, you know, your nervousness hands. I'm jotting down the quick questions that I can think of, you know, five questions that I can do. I knew he had worked for the radio station before. I knew that I thought he'd been fired. It turns out he wasn't, as you hear in the interview. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I'll ask those kinds of things. So I get him on the line and and I don't have an intro. I'm going to have to do an intro later. So I come up and I said, blah, blah, blah. We have Willie Nelson. I worked here at at K-Van and George Azur's. So hi, Willie. So how are you doing? And he says... I'm having more fun than the law allows. Now, what what people don't know is that was the liner that was used for me. Pam Atherton in the mornings, more fun than the law allows. And he had heard it when he was on hold. And that was a good, I mean, that's what a good interviewer, uh, interviewee does is they take everything they can that they hear and use and throw it back into the interview. Hmm. And he did. So I go through the things. I do a fairly good job. And I think I don't have on the interview, I, the one, I think I cropped it out, was where uh, I said at the end, um, so tell us, are you doing anything, you know, for nonprofits or anything? <laughs> and there's this dead silence. And he says, you mean besides Farm Aid? And I'm like, oh, man. How did I walk in that? I'm like, well, yeah, of course, Willie, everybody knows you're famous for Farm Aid. Yeah, no, besides that, you know, which, of course, was not the point. I had totally forgotten about yeah. Farm Aid. <laughs> <laughs> so always do your research. <laughs> and nobody else got an interview with him. He only did it with me because he had worked at that radio station. Mm. So the TV stations in town picked up my audio and ran it on their their shows because nobody else got that interview. Would it be OK at like at the end of this episode if I did play your interview? Oh, yeah, interview? absolutely. Okay. Yeah, because he does tell some great stories, mm-hmm. you know, about how he was, uh, he went in to get a raise and they told him no. And he says, that. so I wasn't fired. I quit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the other thing that I love that you say to your guests is you, you thank them at the end and then you ask them right away if they would want to come back and talk with you sometime. Except when I don't. <laughs> and you, when I don't, that means that they were a problem. <laughs> But most of the time I do. Yeah. But I, 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 yeah, because then I got it on tape, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and some, and I always keep the tape rolling when we're done. And I always say to them, please, when, when I first start, I say to them, hi, this is Pam. I just have some housekeeping here. You know, uh, I have your web address as this, your Twitter is this. And they're like, oh Mm. yeah, great, great, great. And I'll say, great, I'll go ahead and push your book. And if you wouldn't mind, please staying on till the end when I say goodbye so that I can say thank you. Mm. And I do that sometimes, sometimes they can't Mm because we're cut to the line. Mm -hmm. But then other times they do. And that's where I get some of the best testimonials. I mean, that's where Carl Reiner said, he he said to me, he'd never had anybody interview him as well as I did. I mean, Carl Reiner, mm-hmm. you know, and Harvey McKay, you're the best at what you do. I've got that on audio too. So. I mean, how were you feeling when Carl said that to you? Blown away. And he and I then spent another 45 minutes not in the interview talking about some books that he was reading and some things that that you know he was interested in and yeah. so we chatted a lot about that he was amazing did you interview him live or um i'm sorry like face to face no live? um we did it over the phone and when i sent the request in for him i thought i was going to get 15 minutes that's generally mm. what you you either get a 10 minute a 15 or a 20 that's it pretty much when I was talking to his assistant, she said, how long would you like? And I said, I'll take as long as you can give me. She goes, well, would an hour be okay? And I'm like, yes, it will. <laughs> so I actually broke it into two because he had so much to say, and I didn't want people to get tired of listening. So so the other thing was I asked people on Facebook if they had questions for Carl Reiner. Hmm. So I had a whole list of questions that came from other people. Mm-hmm. So I would say, Colleen Lindell was asking, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he would answer it. Then 
I called those people up and I said, can you please ask this question while I tape you? Mm -hmm. So I taped them and actually used their voices in with Carl Reiner's Aww. instead of me asking the question. So I really liked that. That was a lot of fun. But yeah, he's a sharp guy. Great guy. So sweet. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That must have felt so good just to hear that. When of, Yeah. When you hear it from Laura Harvey McKay, who is, I mean, in the business world, he's like the top. Hmm. When you get people who say things like that, you know, you just are astounded. Hmm. And I mean, how else can you say it? But it also reminds you that all that work you spent preparing for the interview. Mm -hmm. You know, Tess Garrison's an example. She wrote the Rizzoli and Isles series. You know, it was on television, mm -hmm. but she's famous. She actually wrote the movie. I mean, she wrote Gravity, and they there's a whole story about how oh. they took it from her and didn't she didn't get any money paid back on it. And so, yeah, it's a, look up Tess Garrison and Gravity. It's an interesting story. Okay. But I had never read her stuff, but I did know about Rizzoli and Isles. So I probably spent four hours the night before. Um, not just reading old interviews of hers um, and bits and pieces about her, but also watching her on YouTube so that I could get a feel for her. Mm -hmm. I'll, if I have a, a famous enough person, I'll watch every interview I can find of them mm -hmm. to get a feel for what works for them, what doesn't. I don't want to ask the same question everybody else asks, too. That's the other problem. Yeah. You know, when you get somebody like a David Baldacci who has been interviewed a thousand times, and you're like, what can I ask him that nobody else has asked him? Hmm. That's a hard one. Mm -hmm. So I go and I find out what everybody else asked him. I may find something five or seven years ago somebody asked, but I can do it in a different way and get something that's interesting. Mm -hmm. But that's that's my hardest one is when I get somebody famous, what can how can I ask them something they haven't been asked before? Mm -hmm. And how do you decide, because you interview such a gamut of people, right. how do you decide who you're curious about talking with and who to go after? How do you choose your guests? Well, in the beginning, I, I went after a lot of guests, but um, now I don't I don't anymore. They pretty much come to me. And the oh. reason is because that once you work with publicists for a period of time and you show them you do a good job, then they want you on the interview tour. And there are a couple of secrets, and I'll tell you what, what some of those are in case you decide to do some of these kinds of people. So, um, you know, one is you have to be good at what you do. So you need to do your research. You need to be prepared. You need to really do a, a kick-ass interview, mm -hmm. okay, of which my intros help me with. Hmm. Um, the second thing is you, when you do your questions, you have to make sure it's not the same old, same old they've heard before. Mm -hmm. And you know what I find? A lot of them, people don't laugh at their jokes. So I'm always laughing. You, you know, you can hear it on the interviews. You are having fun. Like yes. all of your interviews, you are genuinely joyful and having a good time talking with, like yes. you are showing them that you are excited. That I'm to glad to them. have them there. Yeah. yeah. So when you, and that's why I also don't stop doing interviews because if I do, I lose my place and, and I would have to start all over again. So now I have companies like Orit in New York or uh, Lisa Kunin in New York or um, Richard Hoffman out here. Um, you know, Krupp Media, all these places, because they've worked with me, when they get a guest, they'll pitch me. And now I'm also getting them from the actual publishers themselves. David Pogue, who is on uh, CBS as the technology guy, his company knows to call me every time he has a book come out. Mm -hmm. And the Sam Adams guy, um, I think it was Flatiron Press, they called me and said, look, we want you to do this. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because when you give a good interview, that's what the publicist wants to have because then he's showing he's doing his job. Mm -hmm. You could get a whole bunch of you know famous people on WGN and everything else and they give crappy interviews, then the guest is like, yeah, yeah it wasn't that good. Hmm. So you want as many good people as you can. So what I tend to do, because I'm low man on the totem pole, I don't work for WCBS or WGN or you know any of these stations here in town. I'm not near as known. So for me to make sure I keep getting on the list, I always ask to be in last position. Hmm. So if they do that, well, plus I don't like to get up early in the morning, so there's that. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of them will say, look, we've got them from 6 until uh, 1 Eastern time. Okay, so that means 11 o'clock mountain, which is where I do most of my interviews from. So I'll always say last position 20 minutes. And almost always I'll get it. Hmm. And the reason I do last position, why do you think? I'm guessing that it's like coming in as a ray of sunshine and making them super happy and excited to be talking with you because you're going to pump them up. Right. Well, and, and people tend to remember the last thing that happened to them. 
That's how they color their entire thing. There's a great TED uh, talk by Dr. Daniel Kahneman. It's called, it's, I think it has to do with how we remember, and you, you should watch it. It's wonderful. He uses a colonoscopy as an example. But basically, it's the last thing that happens is how the entire event is colored. So if I give a great interview at the end, the guest remembers the whole tour as being good. So that's why nobody ever argues when I ask if I want the end. They're like, yes, we'll give you the, you know, unless they've got a live shot that they've got to do. Hmm. So they're more likely to remember me mm -hmm. if I'm in the last position. Secondly, and this was one with, oh, no, it wasn't Nelson. I can't, Hunter, Hunter, Stephen Hunter. He wrote uh, the, the, he writes a lot of um, suspense books and stuff, but this one was about the Ripper. And it was called I Ripper, I think was the name of it. And he, he's older. And so we're coming at the end and he's telling his his um, people who are running it, the producers, because mm -hmm. they tell me this afterwards. They're like, he's like done. He does not want to do anymore. And mm -hmm. we say to him, look, you need to do this, girl. You, I promise you, you will have a good time. Do this, girl. Mm -hmm. And so he goes ahead and does it. And he's laughing and everything else. And the producer sends me back the thing. And they said it was perfect because he didn't want to do it. And you totally changed his mood. So it was like, oh, good. I did my job. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And I mean, that, that's, that is such a gift that you have that you're able to do that. Well, you, it all comes back to curiosity. Mm -hmm. You know, there, who was, I don't know the name of the guy that was on the Sunday morning program that used to throw a dart at the map and he'd go there and then he would go in the phone book and he'd run his finger and just pick a name mm -hmm. and then he'd go and find the story. Well, basically everybody has a story. Everybody does. And you just need to find out what it is. So sometimes they'll pitch me somebody and I won't, the story doesn't work for me, what it is, but I'll see in his bio or her bio that they also so did something else and I'll be that's where I want to go with it hmm. so I don't always go the normal way for example talk about as guests um, Greta Garner who was Rockford Files Jim Garner's daughter mm -hmm. she wrote a book years ago called the cop cookbook and um, she was pitched to me and I was thinking to myself one of my lists the people on my list is James Garner I hmm. mean yeah, I love this guy so I get Gigi on the phone and I say to her look I, I hate to do this to you I'm gonna ask you about your book but I gotta ask you about your dad and she says to me, it's okay. I know that's how I get the interviews. She said, so I know I have to talk about him for a period of time. But, you know, you're going to also talk about my book. So that's, I got the interview because of my dad. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yes, you did. So I'm able to, you know, put that stuff in there. And then we're able to get into to the book. Mm -hmm. So since you've been talking with people for years now, um, how has like the art of conversation changed? Have you seen it like evolve or even question asking? Well, I think um, it's harder for people uh, like me now to do the podcast because everybody does a podcast now, right? So you you have to really have somebody behind you that says, listen, you need to do this one. So I have a little bit more trouble. So there's two people I can think of right now that they actually pitched me. I said, oh, this would be great. And then they were like, yeah, no, we don't think so. And it's because in their mind, I'm not a big enough podcast for them or whatever and you know you just live with that but then when you get pitched and you do a good one I remain friends with them mm -hmm. you know Jeffrey Deaver who wrote um the the bone collector the movie with bone collector and he's written several other things I interview him almost once a year and we chat about the dog shows he does and everything else I try to stay friends with him but it's hard it's harder sometimes to get some of the interviews because everybody's out there and they have to be the publicists have to be more careful of vetting who they allow to do the interviews. Hmm. You also get sometimes, and again, not your top level people, your top level people, they pretty much get that you get to ask anything that you want to. Mm -hmm. um, but people say, well, can you send me the questions? No, I'm sorry, I don't. I hmm. don't send questions. But by the same token, I also don't edit content. So the only thing I will edit is to sweeten. So like if you're too low, I'll do it up. Or, or if our tracks for some reason got off kilter, you know, because when you're doing Skype, sometimes that happens. But I never edit, edit content. Hmm. So, you know, what you see is what you get. And that's just the name of the game. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know to turn down the people that are just there to sell something. Mm -hmm. You know that because that's, that's, I'm not interested. My, it's not me. My audience isn't interested. You always have to right. remember, what does your audience want to hear? And so a lot of times for me, I'll just say, well, that's not that's not the direction my show goes or that's just not mm. my show's wheelhouse. You know, I'll say something like that. OK, you know, um, but I don't so much get those anymore because if, if I'm getting a tour 
um, they've already been vetted and they've probably been media trained through mm -hmm. the different people. They know. And and I also, if I f I'm afraid something like that's going to happen because I've watched other videos and they've done it, yeah. I'll say to them, and don't you worry, I'm going to be the one talking about your book. So you don't have to worry about selling it. I will take care of that. And then I do a good job of it. Oh. Because they're taught in these media classes, which make me crazy, but they're taught in them to say, well, my book, you can talk to anybody about practically anything, you know, right. uh, by so-and-so that's available on Amazon now. <laughs> these media trainers teach them to do that. It makes me crazy because that's the worst thing for a host. Right. A host is like, oh, okay, you did it once. Don't do it again. Right? Because <laughs> right? my yeah. guests don't want to hear that. Yeah, yeah. It feels like, like you're cheapening you are um, yeah yeah whereas i can say oh my gosh you know barbara in that book when you talked about how to talk to practically anybody one of the things you said was such and such mm -hmm. no i've said the name of the book mm -hmm. now i'm the one doing it and she's not sounding like she's hawking it on a street corner somewhere mm -hmm. and know? then at the end at the during the intro or the outro I always, you're going to plug where you right. where people can go to find and it. when you go to the web page it has where you can it's got a link right to it it's got their twitter it's got this thing if there's a video whatever mm -hmm. i want to do everything i can social media wise to help them mm -hmm. so when people say yeah but you don't have that big of a, an audience you know out there i say no but if you google now you'll see my thing right up there at the top of yours because your video your audio and everything else is there so i'm contributing to them being found more hmm. so that's what you're getting from me mm -hmm. more so than the reach of one time people hearing it because mm -hmm. on terrestrial pretty much that's it one mm -hmm. time and if you're not tuned in at that period of time you don't hear it mm -hmm. um I actually, I did want to ask you one question about sure. your family. You had said before that your father was an engineer. Right. And you grew up in South El, El Monte. I grew up in South El Monte, yeah, in California, in South El Monte. And then we moved to Whittier when I went to high school. I went to school there. I lived in Hollywood for a while, Normandy and Third. And um, then I moved, I lived in Alaska for a little while. And then I came back. And once I got married, we moved to Dallas. And then we moved to a little dicky town in New Mexico. And um, that's when I started doing on air again, because mm -hmm. I hadn't done on air for a long time. And then, you know, as long as you're near an airport, you can, I do speaking for a living, uh, you know, speaking in workshops. Um, so as long as I'm near an airport, I can go and, and do that. And I can do voiceovers from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's really where I want to get more back into, you know, people say, oh, what are the what one thing you really love to do? And I say, well, it's speaking and it's voiceovers. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things that I just I love. I love being in a studio. Pam, what kind of personality type do you have? Do you know? I do. I'm an I'm an extroverted introvert. OK, I was actually going to guess that. Yeah, because if you think about the, the jobs like speaking, you're working with a lot of different people. Right. And then voiceover is like you're very you. quiet. You in the studio. More introspective. Yeah, you get to have time with your own voice. When I do an event, I have to have, especially if I do a lot of them out in public, I need several days at home afterwards to just kind of chill because mm -hmm. I'm done with people for a while. <laughs> You know then, what I mean? Yeah. And then how do you recharge and how do you, what kind of self-care do you give to yourself? Oh, I, I, you know, you go from one thing to the next. I have a friend named Kelly McDonald who is a wonderful speaker and she just released a new book. Um, her whole series is People Not Like You. So it's like how to market to people not like you, hmm. you know, how to have customer service experience for people not like you. And she speaks like 75 days a year. And I was just thinking about this the other day. It's like every third day she's talking somewhere, basically. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. She's not that much younger than me. I don't know where she gets the energy because she doesn't drink. She doesn't do drugs. She doesn't do any of that. And she's like what I aspire to be because I'll do an event and then like the whole next day I'm done and then I can do another event, but then another, I need a day, a day down, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's just, it's just hermiting, watching a lot of law and order. God, I love law and order. It's so good. I just, I love law and order. And you know, the other one I love is major crimes. Mm. I would love to have a walk on on that. I did mm. a lot of walk on work when I was younger and you know how we met was through Grace Carter mm -hmm. and her husband, James L. Carter is a cinematographer. And he, how I met him was there was a movie filmed in New Mexico called Believe in Me, and he mm. was the cinematographer on it. And just to show you where you get guests, you get guests wherever you can when your curiosity is aroused. Mm -hmm. So all the people who worked, um, the gaffers, the grips, the, all those kind of people, they all listened to me in the morning because I was doing an oldie station at the time. So I thought it would be a gag to, which is what we, the term we use in the radio business, to get a, a background part, a couple day background part, make 75 bucks, mm -hmm. and then talk about it on the radio. 
and in the meantime, the directors, the casting directors, the producers, you know, all these people had been on my show to say, we're going to be filming here, you know, if you've got this, blur, blur, blur. So I decided I was going to audition. I pulled my hair back, took off the makeup, put some blue under my eyes, wore a skirt with um, the knee highs that you could just see the difference between your knee high and your skirt, right? You know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. I had a purse over my arm and I affected a limp. And I'd had a friend at the Chamber of Commerce who'd given me the script. So I went through the script and found every female part in the script that wasn't a main part. So I knew how I was going to read anything they threw at me. So I walk in and there's the camera there. They're going to do it. They're going to say, say your name, you know, and then uh, then we'll start. And so their heads are down and it's Cotty Chubb and it's John Manulis and it's the director, Robert. I can't think of his last name now. So I look at the camera and I say, my name's Pam Atherton. And, and their heads just shot up. And they were like, are you the radio lady? I said, yes, sir, I am. And they were like, oh, my God, because I did not look like, you know me, yeah. I'm big hair, jewelry, all that yeah. kind of stuff, right? So I go and I read the part. And they're like, OK, tone it down. And of course, because I come from a background of, of um, stage, so I always overdo. So I was like, <laughs> back it down. OK, and go ahead and go ahead and read this one. Well, I'd already read it. I already knew what I was going to do. So I go ahead and I break it down and I read it and I do the whole thing. It's supposed to be Oklahoma. So I put on a bit of an accent, you know, and uh, I read through the whole thing and, 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 you know, do the stuttering at the appropriate parts and things. And I get off the stage and I walk past and you know this in auditions. They never say anything. Mm-hmm. You know, I walk past and John Manulis says to me, well, there's good news and there's bad news. I said, really? He says, good news is you're on the shoot. I said, great, because the bad news is you have to keep looking like that. And that was not a joke. So I think, great, I've got this two-day bit on the, on the movie, believe in me, until the paperwork comes and I'm contracted for six weeks. Why? As a featured player, yeah, right? It was, it, I got Taft-Hartley because of it. I haven't joined the union yet, but, you know, I was Taft-Hartley. I was like, what? At SAG wages. I was like, what, what, what? Well, so here I am doing a radio show from six in the morning to nine in the morning. Mm-hmm. How am I going to do this? I, I had no idea that, that this is what I was walking into, but it what a blessing. Hmm. So I thought to myself, these guys all have great stories. I have got to get them on the radio. So George, who was the head cameraman who had worked with the Beatles, I had him. I had the art directors who had done all these fabulous things. And I had James L. Carter, the cinematographer. Well, James was hysterical. He would tell these stories about how when he was much younger, one time he hadn't loaded the film canister, you know, (laughs) and he admitted it. You must interview him. He's wonderful. He was so good. James L. Carter was so good that I said to him, I know you're going on to another film. I want you to be my Hollywood correspondent. So for the longest time, every week or two weeks, he would call in and we'd sit around and talk about movies and stuff like that and then he got he worked on csi and we talked about you know things like how they put the the um contacts on their eyes to make them look dead and stuff Mm -hmm. like that and how he had to do special effects in camera i mean it was a wonderful interview and you just never know where they are that's amazing and that's i mean it's so cool that you got to be with all those people who all had and recognize all their different stories they all had great stories every one of them you know, and that was the best part about it was to to be able to pull those stories out of them. Yeah. You know? Gosh. It's like you were in an incubator. <laughs> well, it was. It was <laughs> like so, so much, much fun. Fuel. Yeah. yeah. So there I was not only filming, and we were a six-day-a-week film because we were on location, mm-hmm. right? But then I would have to find time to get them in the studio for a minimum of an hour so I could tape them and then, you know, get it for the show. Yeah. So. Oh, it sounds so energizing. It really, was. Even though it's a lot of, it sounds like a lot of work. We were all really pretty close, I think, because of that, you mm-hmm. know, and they would, it, I think there was a closeness because anytime you're in somebody's bedroom, you're close to them. And so I'm on the radio in the morning and you wake up to it in the morning, I'm in your bedroom. Mm-hmm. So there's mm-hmm. a, an intimacy that, that happens that you don't even know happens because you're not intimate with them. You don't know right. them, but they're intimate with you because you're in their bedroom in the morning. Right. I mean, it sounds strange, but I think there's a They feel a like connection. they know you. Yeah, they do. They yeah. do. Yeah. I, I feel like right now I'm switching to more long form interviews and it's been helping me a lot. Yeah. Because I felt before I had to really spice things up with mixing in music and, and right, things like that. Right, right. It's but time I, consuming. It's time consuming and it's only me. Right. So um, some people have written me and said, I really like when you do long form interviews. Right. And it's okay for you to put more of yourself in there because yes. for a while I was just asking questions and not 
sharing too much about my life. I'm still trying to figure that out, Pam. It's a I, balance, I'll tell you, because for me, um, I when I look at my two, um, you know, the left and right channels, mm-hmm. I can always tell who's the guest and who isn't. Because mm-hmm. there's like a long stretch, that's the guest, and then there's a short thing of me, and then a long thing of the guest. And very rarely, but I will throw something in about me every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but most cases, they're there to hear to see what the guest has to say. But it also has to be a conversation. Hmm. So it can't just be you asking a question and then them answering, you asking a question and answering. It has to be, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. Because I remember in the 70s when that happened. So let me ask you, uh, let's talk about the 70s. You see, so I throw a little bit in, but then I get into the the next one. The follow-up questions, you asked about that, and that's something that, that has always bothered me. You know, a lot of times with these television interviews, they have hours, if not days, to interview somebody. And then they pick and choose the parts that they want. So it always surprises me when they don't ask a follow-up question that's so obvious Hmm. that they should ask. You're just screaming at the TV, why didn't you ask him why he didn't? Mm -hmm. And part of that is because you get so tied to your question list. So I think it was Connie Chung who said that how she used to do it was her people would write up questions, she would write up questions, she would put the two together and meld them and and learn them, and then she would put them in an envelope and wouldn't look at them. Mm. But they were still there at the back of her head. Mm -hmm. And that's really what you have to do. I I was tied to my questions for the first five years that I did a show. I, I had my questions, I had to make sure I asked them, and I was I was nervous as all heck. I was like, how am I going to get that question in? Now I listen more and I jump around. I'll go, oh, oh, that'll go great coming into here. And I'll say, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. You just said such and such. Let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. And it's a question further down on my list. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes they'll say something and I'll be like, oh, that's that's where I need to go. That's the direction. But there, I've often watched those and said they're they're not listening to the li- to the the person they're interviewing. Yeah, I feel like what you're talking about is being very present with the person and t- really tracking. With yeah, the person. and you still have to be able to ask the questions that you want to get out there because you know they're important. Right. But it's okay if you miss a couple of them. Mm-hmm. You know, that's mm-hmm. fine. You always want to have more because they might give you more time or they might be short answered versus the long form ones right and maybe some of the questions that you don't get to maybe they just it it wasn't the right it wasn't the feel of that interview yeah 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 Yeah. it's okay to not not do them well um would you take us out with sharing um with the listeners um who your biggest influencers currently are and um i guess we're you know what your vision is like where you would like to go if there's anything that's been new influencing you so that's the hard part because i'm actually at a crossroads knowing that i need to morph what i'm doing into something else and i don't know what it is so Mm. that's a hard part um as far as influences um i would have to say when i did news for many years and my news influence was always peter jennings and here's a little story i like to tell people when they're like oh i get so nervous i'm not sure i can do it or whatever and i say find the icon that you most admire for me it was peter jennings and then become Peter Jennings. So what I did was I would, when I was doing the news and I was anchoring, I would talk slower. I would use hand movements that were out there and say, thank you, Colleen. We appreciate Colleen because Colleen's been out in the field now with us for the last 10 years. Thanks, Colleen. Let's go back over to camera B. Now, uh, camera B, what have we got going on now? And Mm -hmm. it was just, I, nobody knew I was doing Peter Jennings, but I was doing Peter Jennings. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me through it. And so now I find the same thing is that I will find somebody that I think does a great job and, and follow through like Leslie Stahl. I just was able Mm -hmm. to do an in conversation event with her. And she, by the way, is marvelous. Mm. She's funny. She's warm. She's all these wonderful things. And that was the big surprise to the people in the audience Mm -hmm. was they were like, Oh, we, just didn't expect her to be so warm and soft and funny and and she was but she was an early pioneer and faced a lot of these things that that women had to face and so I think that's um I watch her sometimes and and how she does things and you know when does she move her head does she not you know Hmm. so that's what I do but as far as where the future is I don't really know except for there's always interesting people that that I want to talk to to find stuff out I wonder if um you know, it's great that you know that what you're doing needs to morph into something else. That means that you feel a transition coming on. Yeah. And I wonder if that is not created yet. 
I wonder if it's something that doesn't exist. You know, and I think I told you this when you first wanted to get into podcasting. I said the things that are out there may not have even been invented yet. Yeah. You know, I, I know I told my daughter that don't worry about what you're going to be when you grow up because what you're going to be hasn't been invented yet, right. which wasn't true when I was growing up. It was all pretty much, you know, the same thing. The only thing that changed was women weren't really in radio when I was young. And I was the first in, in 1996, mind you, I was the first female morning show host in the Portland market, Portland, um, Oregon. There were there were co-hosts, there were laughers, but no one who was the leader in the show. So, you know, in 1996, you know, that's, I mean, (laughs) it's crazy, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think young women today don't realize how far we've had to fight to get to where we are. And I think I wish that's one thing I wish millennial women knew Hmm. was you guys don't know what it was like to be, honey, go make me a cup of coffee, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. or to, uh, I was in the electronics field for a while and I was not allowed to use my name. I had to use P Atherton because uh, people universally throughout the United States and the world didn't want to um, do business with a woman. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are things that we all dealt with, you know, and we know how far we've come. And it's like, I would like millennial women to know that. Yeah, it's for us, the path has been already paved. And so we don't have a very good understanding. Um, But it's good. It's good if people share their stories about like what you've endured or what you've kind of gone through in order to right to get where you're going. Yeah. Yeah, because you to me are a pioneer. I, I feel. Well, I wouldn't say that, but there weren't very many women doing podcasting when I started. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, there were women doing um, foo-foo shows, mm. you know. There's the cooking and the cleaning and the... And I, and I don't mean to denigrate that because, trust me, I can't cook for nothing. So, <laughs> But, you know, I mean, we think of those as that kind of a thing. There was nobody doing just straight talk um other than terry gross with fresh air um there's a woman in new york there's a woman in atlanta but for the most part there weren't a lot of women out there uh, Mm -hmm. doing things at that time yeah thank you pam thank Thank you you. so much i'm so thrilled would you want to come back and be on my show again absolutely you can find a closer look podcast on itunes or at a closer look radio.com If you're interested in having Pam come speak to your group or you'd like to workshop with Pam, go to pamatherton.com. I know we've talked about a plethora of people today. There are links to each author Pam mentioned, as well as some of her recent interviews and links to the microphones we talked about in the beginning. If you're interested in starting a podcast, these are the mics I think you'd want. All links can be found in the show notes, which you can find wherever you are currently listening to this episode. Playing underneath this is a track called Overflow by the artist Home, off the album Before the Night. You can find more of Home on SoundCloud and Bandcamp. The cover art for this show by the ever-fascinating Eva Fan. You can find more musings by Eva, including paintings and illustrations, at evafan.com. Lastly, today is International Podcast Day. To all my fellow podcasters out there, please stay curious. Do not lose heart. Keep making your show. Ask questions. Stay open. Stay vulnerable. Whatever you're doing is healing and entertaining in some way to someone. These are the things that I personally run up against in the making of my own show. Will this affect anyone? Does it matter? Yes, it matters. Be brave and keep going. And if you're interested in starting a podcast, do it. Let your voice be heard. Go to internationalpodcastday.com or podcastanswerman.com. This is how I learned to podcast was by studying tutorials like these. And there are links to these also in the show notes. And lastly, lastly, following this is Pam's interview with Willie Nelson, which is a sheer delight to listen to. This episode of Mostly Minutia was recorded on location at Epiphany Space in Hollywood, California. Epiphany Space is a nonprofit co working space with quaint rooms, including outdoor working space and complimentary espresso. To learn more about daily rates, renting a room, and membership, go to epiphanyspace.com.
when I went out to the fair, I asked everyone out there, what's your favorite thing? What do you want to see? Everybody all said Willie Nelson, Willie Nelson, Willie Nelson. Thank you, Pam. Willie, tell me a little bit about your time here at K-Van. You were a disc jockey here, weren't you? I had more fun than the law allowed. <laughs> I, there was three of us there at K-Van at the time. It was me and the Cactus Ken board and Shorty the hired hand. Well, rumor has it that you got fired from here because you wanted to play some of your own music or you asked for a raise? Yeah, I asked for a raise, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the next thing I know, I'm in my car headed back to Texas. You know? But was that maybe the lucky break for you? Probably so. Uh, you know, all things, you know, happens for the best. And you'd been working on some music here anyway, hadn't you? Yeah, and I just had a visit from a, a lady uh, named May Axton came by, and she's the gal that wrote Heartbreak Hotel. Hoyt Axton's mom. Yeah, Hoyt Axton's uh, mother. Yeah. And uh, she was through there doing, uh, through here, she was doing uh, some advanced work for Hank Snow. She stopped by the radio station to plug his tour, and we got to know each other. And she listened to some of my songs and said, hey, you ought to go to Nashville. And so you took her up on that idea. Well, yeah, by the way, I texted <laughs> Well, you perform in a town sometimes with uh, Waylon Jennings in, in Texas, right outside of uh, Clovis, New Mexico, uh, every once in a while, don't you? The Waylon's hometown? Oh, Littlefield, Texas. Right. Yeah, well, I've been, you know, I played there a couple of times with him and played some dominoes over there. It got beat real bad. <laughs> yeah. Those Texas boys are tough. They really are. Yeah. So you uh, enjoyed your time here at K-Van, and you got fired. You did took your music on the road and made it into Nashville. Actually, to, to clear up the history there, uh, I asked for a raise. The gentleman said, we can't afford to pay you any more money. And I said, well, I guess I'll have to quit. Okay. So that's that was... Uh, the way it worked, I was not fired. No. Well, you know, I've always heard that uh, you're nobody in the disc jockey business till you've been fired three times. Well, I had been fired, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't one of them. And I was fired probably two or three times later. This particular time, I wasn't fired. Now, what keeps your band together? What keeps you hopping? I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> not good for you, Willie. <laughs> well, I heard somewhere that 78, after 78 cups, you can get caffeine poisoning. So uh, <laughs> I'm trying to stay under that. What about, uh, what about your future in the mood? I've got a couple of movies coming out uh, in February, uh, one okay. with uh, Robert De Niro and uh, Dustin Hoffman. Are you actually in them, or you perform the music for them? No, I'm, I'm, we're doing scenes together in there. It's, uh, it's a movie called Wag the Dog. When's the last time that you were on screen? I just did a movie with Danny uh, Glover and Joe Pesky called Gone Fishing. Uh-huh. And uh, did a have a TV show that I just did with Don Johnson, his new Nash Bridges uh, television show. Yeah. So I've been doing a little bit of it. I'd rather play music than yeah. anything. Yeah. What are we uh, What are we going to hear at the Clark County Fair? Two hours, and uh, I don't know what it'll be. <laughs> <laughs> Any new stuff? Maybe three hours. I don't know. We played three hours the night before last at the Wee Fest. Oh yeah. But we didn't have a curfew or anything, and we, the crowd was great, and we got turned on. So I don't know. We'll just see what happens tomorrow night. But I'm looking forward to it. It's been a long time since I've. Uh, you know, been here, and I got a lot of friends here. Somebody told me it's been about 40 years since you've been here. 40, 45, somewhere in there. Uh, I've been back to Portland, uh, but I haven't, you know, played across the river. Of all of the new talent that's coming up uh, in country music, what do you think of it, number one, and, and uh, what artist do you really see as being a shining uh, star? I like Ray Price. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got a future. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking along the lines of like the Leanne Rhymes. Oh, you know? she's great too. Yeah, she's a great gal, yeah, good singer, and uh, very young. You know, uh, yeah. To be that popular, that young, is a, is a is a big test for Leanne. You know. And what kind of problems do you know from being in the business that she's going to encounter that maybe she's just not prepared for? Well, again, uh, whatever problems she's going to have, she's going to have them early <laughs> yeah. in life. And uh, if she can figure them out, you know, Tanya Tucker has uh, had the same thing. A lot of young people uh, who have big hits uh, manage to go ahead and, and, you know, Brenda Lee and a lot of these people. But it's really difficult when you're that young to hang on to it and to know what to do with it and to be able to handle it. Uh, uh, me, I didn't have really a lot of big success until I was older and uh, I didn't have much more sense but <laughs> uh, I felt like I'd learned a little bit. What do you account for the fact, what do you attribute to the fact that you have been so successful and so popular 
one thing is that me and the band have been here a long time, and uh, we know we know a lot of songs, and we know a lot of different ways to play them, and uh, our audience is sort of uh, uh, varied. We've got young people, we've got the senior citizens, we've got babies, and we've got teenagers, and and uh, of course everybody likes on the road again. I mean, everybody likes yeah. uh, Stardust, and so it's really kind of hard to uh, to put labels on anything because when you get a group of people together that likes all good music, uh, you can't lose. And your music still endures. I think that's really an important part. And and uh, the new things, are you working on some new things now? Uh, yeah, I'm writing another album. Uh, the last stuff that I wrote was the, the Spirit album. And uh, this one will be sort of uh, more of the same, I think. Will you come to visit us here at K-Van? Well, I would love to. I'd love to do another couple hours a day over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe, I, maybe next year I'll come by there and we can work something out. Will you? And I'll, I'll make sure the boss gives you a raise. I promise. Well, I'll start out with a raise. That'll make just make me feel better anyway. I promise. Well, I, I'm going to hold you to that. I hope you will come and visit us here at the station. We'd like to have you very much. Thank you, Pam. Nice and we look forward to uh, your concert. Thanks. Thanks.